This is a lecture on Gustave Flaubert's Three Tales, or Trois Contes. This is one of the most influential of the early modern texts, and uh, uh, it's really worth a careful read for so many different readings, uh, uh, excuse me, for so many different reasons. And we're going to look at um, uh, the three tales that appear in this triptych of stories and talk about some of the generic and thematic dimensions of this text that have proven to be so influential to writers after Flaubert. Um, just a few facts about Flaubert's life. He lived from 1821 to 1880. Of course, his most famous work is Madame Bovary, which was published in 1857. But he wrote a number of other texts as well, uh, such as Salambo, which is published in 1862, Sentimental Education in 1869, Three Tales in 1877, and Bouvard and Pécuchet, which was published in 1881 posthumously, uh, was not finished. I find myself that it's one of his most interesting works, certainly one of his most funny uh, works. But we can see, like in the case of Salambo and some of the other texts that he wrote that I've not mentioned here, um, Flaubert was also very much influenced by uh, Orientalism. And I want to, as we go through uh, these tales that appear, I'd like to compare them to what's going on into painting in France at this time. And we can see there's a, there's a sense in which realism, you know, Flaubert is considered by many to be a great literary realist, and not one of the perhaps greatest literary realists, along with Leo Tolstoy uh, of, of the of the 19th century. He also anticipates the end of literary, literary realism and the transition to modernism in which uh, an era in which writers are increasingly suspicious of some of the presuppositions of literary realism. And, and as, as Roland Barthes and others have argued, Flaubert uh, you know, takes literary realism to, to about as far as you can take it. And, uh, and, and, and arguably brings this uh, uh, approach to writing, this generic approach to composition to, to an end, or at least brings it to its apex. Um, here are a few writers who are influenced by Flaubert. Gertrude Stein, um, her, uh, she has a, a book called Three Lives, which are straight up influenced by Flaubert in very, very many overt ways in terms of how she uh, structures that uh, composition. Uh, Milan Kundera is art of the novel. He, he uh, indicates that, you know, with Flaubert's take, turning of uh, poetry, uh, excuse me, prose into poetry signals a total transformation for Kundera anyway of the um, of novel writing itself. And so in Kundera's, Milan Kundera's Art of the Novel, he's of course the author of Unbearable Lightness of Being, Book of Laughter and Forgetting, among other texts. He sees as Flaubert, he quotes Hemingway, who says, he calls Flaubert our most venerated master. And so, you know, Flaubert influences uh, so, so many writers. Now it was Ezra Pound who picks up from Flaubert this doctrine of le mot juste or the exact right word, teaches it to Hemingway, among others. Um, who also uh, was, was uh, profoundly influenced by Flaubert, although uh, as a writer of poetry rather than prose. And of course, Emile Zola um, was also influenced by Flaubert as well. These are, these are just a few of the writers influenced by Flaubert. There are many others that one, one might mention, um, but uh, I just mentioned these in passing to, to emphasize or to illustrate how significant his influence really was on those writers that came after him. Now, one of those writers that he profoundly influenced was James Joyce, who was said to have memorized entire passages of Flaubert's sentimental education. And when, when one takes a look at, uh, at, at Joyce's Dubliners, uh, the, the, the influence of Flaubert is so uh, profound, um, you know, it's, it's really hard to overemphasize. Now, the doctrine of the epiphany that is often attributed to James Joyce, uh, of course, epiphany is, is a religious term related to a Christian uh, celebration in the Christian liturgical cycle when the three magi come to visit uh, the Christ child shortly after the, the nativity. 
um, Joyce takes this theological concepts and adapts it to study or to 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 uh, uh, to, to literature. Uh, and, and now in literary studies, it's become a uh, you know, standard uh, term that's used in literary analysis. But, but really, we're going to see there, you know, Joyce pretty much adopts this thinking, not just from Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, from who, who also influenced Joyce, but from, from Flaubert and from his, Joyce's careful study of Flaubert and especially Flaubert's Three Tales. Now, epiphany means a moment of illumination, a, a, a sort of light that shines forth, a, a revelation. And we're going to see how this notion also informs the stories of, of Flaubert as well. But you can't really understand Joyce unless you understand the doctrine of the epiphany, at least as he, as he understood it. And this really comes from his, uh, uh, his reading of, of Flaubert. Now, the doctrine of the epiphany is also linked to the doctrine of transubstantiation. Both one of the things that both Joyce and Flaubert have in common is that they were both Catholics or they were both raised in a Catholic tradition. Now, they weren't uh, Catholics in the, in, the, in the sense that they were uh, observant Catholics or, or even uh, believers, I, you know, by the, uh, by, by the end of their lives anyway. It's uh, Joyce, in any case, firmly repudiated the Catholic tradition. And yet he was he remained very much influenced by the tradition that he repudiated. And the doctrine of transubstantiation is is a part of the Catholic tradition. It's not in the Protestant traditions, but this doctrine implies that when one partakes of the elements during Eucharist or during communion, uh, one uh, that, that when the elements are consecrated in mass, that there, that that the bread becomes literally the body of Christ, and the and the wine becomes the blood of Christ, and this is a very important part of the Catholic tradition. In, in the Protestant tradition, one just takes communion, um, and does not. It says it's a token of remembrance of Christ, but in the Catholic tradition, there is there is a process of transformation, in, in the very elements that occurs. And I, I mention this because now Joyce, especially in his writing of Dubliners is going to say that he wanted to take the dirty, grimy elements of the streets of Dublin, life in Dublin, and, and, and he compared what he was doing as being akin to what the priest does in the celebration of the Eucharist, of, of, of creating a transformation of base matter into something that is uh, divine. And, and in effect, this is also linked to the idea of what of what the epiphany really is when, uh, when, when the truth discloses itself as, as an event in time. We think of, for instance, when, when, the, uh, when, when the Magi uh, come to visit the, the, the Christ child and they bring their gifts of frankincense, gold, and myrrh, they're, they're effectively relinquishing those, uh, those uh, tricks of the trade of, 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 as magicians because they recognize that, that this baby in the manger is not just a baby, but is an incarnation of, of the divine. So they're effectively surrendering the, uh, the tricks of their trade uh, because this, there, is a, there is a moment of, of imminence or manifestation that takes place. Now, we're going to see when we look closely at Flaubert's Three Tales that this notion is present also in his Three Tales. But I, I would suggest to you that one of the things that makes, say, even though Joyce was influenced by Flaubert in his adopting of this this uh, notion of the epiphany and adapting it to literary and for literary purposes, that nonetheless with with Flaubert, uh, the the epiphany that occurs, you know, there, there's quite a bit of debate about this among literary critics, but but one could certainly argue that in Flaubert's case that that it's it's an ironic epiphany and that perhaps Joyce excuse me, Flaubert is even making fun of the doctrine of tr transubstantiation or the very idea of the epiphany. And, and he's maybe he's mocking the epiphany. Uh, Frederick Jameson, for instance, is going to argue this, make this argument that these moments of illumination in Flaubert's three tales are sham. He call, Jameson uses the word that they're sham or that they're, they're bogus uh, epiphanies. Um, uh, ben Stoltzfus, another critic of uh, Flaubert, is going to say that, or, or he, well, he's actually celebrating Flaubert because Stoltzfus was not himself Catholic, is going to say that uh, Flaubert is having a good joke 
at the expense of the faithful and the way that he presents these moments of epiphany in uh, in his stories. I, I think that, that maybe perhaps in the later Joyce, like the Joyce of Ulysses, this might be the case that you, Joyce moves increasingly towards a more ironic uh, presentation of this notion. But certainly in Dubliners, Joyce seems to be in earnest about the idea of the epiphany in a way that Flaubert may be uh, taking a more comical uh, approach. Uh, we'll see this in the case of uh, Felicite, the, the, uh, the, the first figure that he presents us with in his uh, three tales. So let's, let's move directly into this. Now, one of the things we could say that's also interesting about jo uh, Flaubert's Three Tales is that it's, a, it's effectively a kind of a triptych, is one way of describing it. And I've shown you an image here of what a triptych is. It's a kind of a panel that, that can be used as a movable altar that has three parts to it and 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 in the uh you know like for instance one could fold this up take it with one and create a kind of a movable chapel but in a way we in these three stories that joyce presents each one is it we could think of them as a different panel in this triptych that he creates and we're going to see that each story in these three stories offers us a, a, a an image of a life of a saint each saint is is presented in a slightly different way but it, but it effectively is a kind of a, a triptych. This might be one way of thinking about generically what Joyce is doing, excuse me, Flaubert is doing, and what Gertrude Stein in her three lives is going to follow suit when she uh, is influenced by uh, Flaubert in, in her presentation. Um, so, okay, so, so now if we're looking at this narrative as, you know, one of the reasons why many writers, creative writers, are very interested in three tales is, is the way in which Flaubert is playing around with theme, motif, and genre. So I want to be uh, careful about our terms. First, let's start with genre. Now, genre is a kind of a literary form. We might think of it as a sort of a social contract. And what's interesting about these, one of the things that's interesting about this book is that although we have three different tales, and each of the tales are unified by a particular theme, and I, the theme here we could, we're, I'm identifying as a pattern of ideas, uh, and in this case, the theme is the theme of saintliness. We have an, a depiction of the life of three different saints in these tales. We have we have Felicite, who's a rather simple peasant woman, and uh, Flaubert tells us the story of her life. And then we have the story of Saint Julian, who is a medieval saint, the saint of hospitality. And then and then in the final. Uh, panel in, in Flaubert's triptych, we have the story of John the Baptist uh, from uh, biblical times or from the time of, of the uh, life of Christ some 2,000 years ago. And so uh, what's interesting, though, is that although these three tales are unified in terms of the theme, the pattern of ideas that runs through uh, the, the, these different narratives, the theme of saintliness, Generically, each uh, story that Flaubert tells is told in a different way. And this was one of the reasons why Milan Kundera, in his art of the novel, is so interested in what Flaubert is doing uh, in a formal sense, experimentally playing around with bringing different genres together. And also the idea that what, you know, what holds together these three stories is not chronolog the chronological unfolding of events in time. They're held together rather by theme or the pattern of ideas that that uh, unify the different narratives, although they are told in, across different centuries and generically sort of packaged, so to speak, in different ways. And they're also uh, unified by motif, which is to say a pattern of images. And one of the motifs, as we're going to see, is, is the motif of the epiphany that each of the different tales, you know, unified uh, by, uh, along the lines of thematically speaking, because we're telling this tale of three different saints, they're also uh, unified uh, insofar as we have similar images, mo the motif of, of epiphany, which occurs, and we have emanations of, of light in each case that, uh, that bring together these different tales. And so, uh, you know, Flaubert really is a kind of a pioneer in, in, in his innovations and he also, so this is one of the reasons why he influenced so many writers and continues to do so. 
but also he you know introduces this doctrine of le mot juste or the exact right word now this is the idea that there is in effect uh, a right word to describe the thing that is being described by the writer uh, now roland bart in his writing degree zero published in 1953 is going to speak of what he calls the flaubertization of language this is very similar to what kundera is saying is that when he says that after flaubert that prose takes on the the prose in the novel takes on the requirements of, of poetry this is partly because flaubert was was it was a bit of an obsessive writer he would spend you know day after day living living a quite almost monastic existence desperately searching for the exact right word to describe the thing that it was that he was describing and um and and what bart is going to suggest is that perhaps in in the um uh, obsessive nature of his quest to find the exact right word, Flaubert began to lose faith in the belief that there was such a thing as a, a mot juste or an exact right word uh, to describe the thing that it was that was being described. And so it's uh, Bar Bart is going to suggest that after Flaubert, uh, representational discourse loses its impetus, or that writing becomes not so much about the representation of things, but about writing uh, itself. Uh, this is a provocative thesis. I just throw this out as something for you to think about and for further uh, exploration. Now, in the first uh, story in this triptych is the story entitled The Simple Heart. This is, again, the story of Felicite. She's a rather simple-minded peasant woman. And I show you an image. Again, I'm, I'm bringing in images of painting to help illustrate this. In the 19th century, in France, for instance, the literary realism was also, uh, you know, uh, mirrored in the kind of painting that took place at this time. And you can see, if you just look at this image, this is this gives us an, an example of, you know, realism. This is, of course, you know, prior to the invention of photography. This is uh, prior to uh, the impressionist moment, prior to modernism, prior to cubism, and so on. And so, painting in this sense still has the function of representing the real as does literary realism itself. If we think, for instance, of the novels of Tolstoy, like War and Peace or Anna Karenina. And so a simple heart, as is also the case, say, of Flaubert's Madame Bovary, is, is told following the generic conventions of literary realism, in which the, the, the word, let's say the sign, is, represents a, a particular thing in, in the ontological or, or historical material world. And um, so, you know, it, it, it almost has a, this, this image that we're looking at almost has a photographic quality. And that the function of the sign in this sense is to represent the thing. And so the quest to find the mot juste or the exact right word is the quest to find the word that accurately represents the thing or that we could even say releases the essence of the thing. Uh, whether or not signs can do this is another question, but literary realism uh, seems to presuppose that this is in fact the case. And so by following the conventions of literary realism, Flaubert uh, is, is essentially uh, uh, doing what many of the painters of his era are doing. But there is, uh, in the late 19th century, a profound shift that occurs as French painters, Spanish painters, and so on, begin to increasingly abandon the conventions of, uh, of, of realism, and so too, this is the case uh, for writers as well. And now here is a famous painting by Henri Fantin Latour, uh, uh, pub, uh, painted in 1872, who was roughly a contemporary of uh, Flaubert. And you can see here the painting of the modernist poets there in the far corner of uh, Verlaine and, and Rimbaud. Uh, and, and again, it's, but what you can see is if we look at this painting, it's, it, rem it, it remains representational. Now, Rimbaud especially is, is an important figure of, of modernism and, and modernist poetry. He is, as Andre Breton is going to suggest, a precursor of surrealism. But this representation of Rimbaud is not surreal, nor is it even particularly modern. It remains, uh, you know, wedded to the conventions of literary realism. Here's a more close-up image of Rimbaud to the right and Verlaine to the left. These two uh, very important modern poets who were also were uh, they came a little bit after uh, Flaubert, but but roughly uh, contemporaries.
So here, here are some more in instances of literary realism. Now, in the case of the Delacroix, a very famous painting, which you even see on French currency, it, it, it's, there's, a, there's an idealized, romanticized element to it. It's, you know, liberty is being, you know, al almost allegorically represented in this image. In, in the Colbert paintings, we can see it's more, again, it's, it's con fairly conventional literary realism, although one could argue that the on the figure on the right, for instance, begin, anticipates some of the paintings of, of Cezanne even, but we still remain within the, the world uh, and the conventions of literary realism, as is also true of Flaubert's uh, A Simple Heart, the first panel in this triptych. Now here you see on the left, you see an image of this little pavilion. It's in Rouen where Flaubert lived. You can go visit it today. This was a little pavilion where Flaubert spent his mornings and afternoons writing in this very uh, monastic, almost fanatical fashion. And there on the right is, is an image of a parrot, a stuffed parrot. And it said that Flaubert, when he wrote A Simple Heart, which uh, as we'll see at the, at the epiphany of which a, a parrot uh, uh, looms large over the head of the saintly figure Felicite, that when Flaubert wrote it, he literally put a parrot on his desk and stared at it in order to be accurate, as accurate as possible in his word choice of this particular uh, bird that he's writing about in his story. And this is what, again, what literary realism seeks to do. Um, but the question is, is, is there such a thing as a right word to represent the right thing? Now, uh, the 19th century is also the era of what's called edemic linguistics, or as, as from Adam, with the, with the theological notion being that the task of Adam in the garden is, is to name. Adam gives the, 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 all, the right name to each thing in, in the garden. And that when Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden, language is said to undergo a, a primordial fall where words and things go their separate ways. And so the Flaubertian doctrine of Limoges Juste implies that the writer must find the exact right word to represent the thing and but but again, this is a very theological, metaphysical notion of of language and its function. And this is what Bart is suggesting: is that 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 Flaubert became so uh, obsessed with finding the exact right word to represent the thing that he finally realized the illusory nature of this pursuit, and and simply gave it up. And so this is the moment again: this Flaubertization of language, or what Bart calls writing degree zero where you know words and things just simply go their separate ways and we're right where fiction becomes after flaubert increasingly metaphysical it becomes a, a writing about writing rather than a writing about the uh the, the material or ontological world well that's that's an interesting uh, argument and i i don't want to suggest to you what is the correct way to think about this but it is historically true that that um you know that that flaubert you know was obsessed with this doctrine of limoges Juste. Uh, Hemingway learned it from Pound, who learned it from Flaubert, and Flaubert, um, you know, stared uh, at, at, at this parrot as he wrote this story, A Simple Heart, and the parrot, as we're going to see, becomes a kind of a symbol of, of the Holy Spirit for this rather simple-minded peasant woman, Felicite. All right, let's, let's, I'm going to give you an example of Flaubert's literary realism. We'll just take, I'm just taking a, a paragraph from his uh, story, to, and this, this illustrates, I think, very well, very conventional literary realism in Flaubert's approach where he's describing the house of Madame uh, Aubain. He says that the house had a, slat, a slate roof and stood between an alley and a narrow street leading down to the river. Inside, the floors were at different levels, making it very easy to trip up. A narrow hallway separated the kitchen from the living room in which Madame Aubain remained all day long, sitting in a wicker chair uh, close the ca to the casement window. Against the wainscoting, which was painted white, there stood a row of eight mahogany chairs. A barometer hung on the wall above an old piano, piled high with a pyramid-shaped assortment of packets and cardboard boxes. Two easy chairs upholstered in tapestry stood on either side of a Louis Cannes style mantelpiece and yellow marble. The clock in the middle was designed to look like a temple of Vesta and the whole room smelt musty due to the fact that the floor level was lower than the garden. 
All right, so this is in the opening uh, lines or second, I think it's the second or third paragraph in A Simple Heart. And you can see here, this is very traditional, very conventional 19th century literary realism. It almost borders on what is called naturalism in the sense that it's so detailed in its representation of the real. So it's hardly a flight in, into fantasy. This is the kind of writing that the surrealists who come after Flaubert, like André Breton, are going to find to be uh, very uninteresting and very uh, worthy of, of abandoning. Here's, let's read, uh, I'm gonna read you just a brief paragraph from André Breton's Manifesto of Surrealism in which he scathingly attacks this kind of writing that we see in, in this story, or at least in the opening passages of this story. Here's Breton. If the purely informative style of which the sentence just quoted is a prime example is virtually the rule rather than the exception in the novel form, it is because in all fairness, the author's ambition is severely circumscribed. The circumstantial, needlessly specific nature of each of their notations leads me to believe that they are perpetuating a joke at my expense. I am not spared even one of the character's slightest vacillations. Will he be fair-headed? What will his name be? Will we meet him during the summer? So many questions resolved once and for all as chance directs. The, the only discretionary power left me, Breton says, is to close the book, which I am careful to do somewhere in the vicinity of the first page. And the descriptions, there is nothing to which their vacuity can be compared. They are nothing but so many superimposed images taken from some stock catalog, which the character utilizes more and more whenever he chooses. He seizes the opportunity to slip me his postcards. He tries to make me agree with him about the cliches. And so I, th I think, you know, this, this uh, certainly Breton would, would close the book after reading this paragraph by Flaubert, if that's where, if, he, if Flaubert had continued in this vein. Now, Flaubert does not. Um, he, he begins with the conventions of literary realism, but then he begins to play around with them. But that paragraph that I just read to you is, 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 a, is a case study of what literary realism is. Now, let me read to you the, the paragraph uh, uh, that, that from Dostoy Fyodor Dostoevsky that Breton uh, finds so uh, disgusting in, in his rejection of realism. And you'll see this paragraph from Dostoevsky is very similar to the paragraph that we just read from uh, um, Flaubert. A simple heart. Here's this from Crime and Punishment. The small room into which the young man was shown was covered with yellow wallpaper. There were geraniums in the windows, which were covered with muslin curtains. The setting sun cast a harsh light over the entire setting. There was nothing special about the room. The furniture of yellow wood was all very old. A sofa with a tall back turned down, an oval table opposite the sofa, a dressing table and a mirror set against the pier glass, some chairs along the walls, two or three etchings of no value portraying some German girls with birds in their hands. Such were the furnishings. Now, Breton finds this to be deathly dull writing and he realism itself, which he's going to connect to uh, to Thomism, to a uh, theological realism, and see as, as, as embodying an, uh, an attitude, a, a philosophy of life, which he rejects, he, you know, he, he, he completely rejects and finds uh, very uninteresting. Here's, here's Breton's uh, uh, rejection uh, from, again, Manifesto of Surrealism. It may be argued that this schoolboy description has its place. And that at this juncture of the book by Dostoevsky, the author has his reasons for burdening me. Nevertheless, he is wasting his time, for I refuse to go into his room. Others' laziness or fatigue does not interest me. I have too unstable a notion of the continuity of life to equate or compare my moments of depression or weakness with my best moments. When one ceases to feel, I am of the opinion one should keep quiet. And I would like it understood that I am not accusing or condemning lack of originality of such. I am only saying that I do not take particular note of the empty moments of my life, that it may be unworthy for any man to crystallize those which seem to him to be so. I shall, with your permission, ignore the description of that room and many more like it. And so you can see here the the uh, this is going to be the, this this has been, been published in the 1920s. The attitude of the surrealist towards literary realism was just one of, 
you know, just total rejection. And so, you know, Flaubert is writing at a point where literary realism is, is still hegemonic. It still rules the day. Uh, surrealists, modernists like Breton have not come along and said, you know, away with this kind of schoolboy describing of the so-called real. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, Flaubert in his we could say deconstruction of literary realism very much anticipates uh, Breton, but in the beginning pages of this narrative, he seems to be falling very much within the strictures of this uh, of these literary conventions. Okay, here's here's an instance of uh, what surrealist painting looks like. If you're not familiar with it, this is Rene Magritte, who lived from 1898 to 1967. You can see here. Uh, these fantastic images, uh, you know, surrealism was about the juxtapositioning of two th things that were completely disparate and would cause a kind of a mental stasis in the minds. If we see these gentlemen that are floating up into the sky, or the man with the apple in his face, it's like it doesn't belong there. Well, that's 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 the point. And as and as we can see here, uh, the pipe. Uh, this is not a pipe. Very famous painting. Uh, no, it's not a pipe. It is it is a painting, and this was also, again, an, an implicit critique of, uh, of of literary realism that painting is painting. It's not uh, the uh, it's not a representation of the real. Okay, here's here's uh, let's let's read now Flaubert's uh, description of the parrot from A Simple Heart, and we're going to see that uh, his, his description starts to become quite ironic and perhaps even sacrilegious irreverent a bit because the parrot becomes effectively uh, conflated with the Holy Spirit, at least in the imagination of this, this rather simple old woman, uh, Felicite. Flaubert writes, the children were seated in their choir stalls, the boys on the right and the girls on the left. The priest stood in front of them beside the lectern. One of the stained glass windows in the apse showed the Holy Spirit looking down on the Virgin Mary. In another, the Virgin knelt before the infant Jesus, and behind the tabernacle, there was a carving in the wood representing St. Michael slaying the dragon. Felicite loved lambs because of her love for the Lamb of God, and doves reminded her of the Holy Spirit. She found it difficult to imagine what the Holy Spirit actually looked like, because he was not only a bird, but sometimes a fire and sometimes a breath. Perhaps it was the light of the Holy Spirit she would see at nighttime, flickering at the edge of the marshes, or his breath, which drove the clouds across the sky, or his voice, which made the church bells ring so beautifully. She sat wrapped in adoration of these wonders, delighting in the coolness of the stone walls and the peacefulness of the church. So, here, you know, Flaubert's kind of, you know, he's playing around a little bit. The, you know, this is a, the parrot's a bird. Holy Spirit is in Christian iconography represented as a dove. She's sitting in the church. She looks at the, at the bird. She thinks about uh, the, her parrot. Uh, and uh, she begins to make this kind of uh, conflation. But Flaubert is sort of playing around with this. Now, Flaubert was asked, uh, when, when someone asked him point blank, is is uh, is 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 are you making fun of this old woman? Are you making fun of Christian theology? He said, "Oh no, no, no! This is a quite a serious, quite a sad story." But you know, Flaubert. It's hard to know. He's he was he was a very ironic person, and hard you know it's hard to take him at, at his word. And finally, it's up for each individual reader to judge for him or herself what is actually going on in this story. Um, let's continue with Flaubert's language. When she went to church, Felicite, she would sit gazing at the picture of the Holy Spirit, and it struck her that it rather looked like her parrot. The parrot's name is Lulu. The resemblance was even more striking in an Ipanal color print depicting our Lord's baptism. The dove has wings of crimson and a body of emerald green, and it looked for all the world like Lulu. In her mind, the one became associated with the other the parrot becoming sanctified by connection with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit in turn acquiring added life and meaning. Surely it, it could not have been a dove that God had chosen to speak through, since doves cannot talk. It must have been one of Lulu's ancestors. Felicite would say her prayers with her eyes, 
turned toward the picture, but every now and then she turned her head, she would turn her head slightly to look at the parrot. The following day, a notice appeared on the front door. The apothecary shouted into Felicite's ear that the house was for sale. What upset her, the, uh, what, what upset her most was the thought of having to move out of her own room for it was the perfect place for poor Lulu, her stuffed parrot. In her anguish, she would gaze at him and beg the Holy Spirit to come to her aid. She developed the idolatrous, hab idolatrous habit of kneeling in front of the parrot to say her prayers. Sometimes the sun would catch the parrot's glass eye as it came through the little window, causing an emanation of radiant light that sent her into ecstasies. Okay, this is quite comical when one looks at what's being described here that the stuffed parrot you know this 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 kind of feeble-minded old woman is kneeling before a stuffed parrot which has become an altar to the holy spirit and a, a light catches the eye glass eye of the stuffed parrot and a ray comes out of it and she has a kind of a religious ecstasy and so we have to ask ourselves was well, is flaubert being serious here uh or is he making fun of her? And different critics have had different things to say about that. And here's, you know, Lulu towards the end, the stuffed parrot gets sadder and sadder and starts falling apart, but she can't tell because she's blind now. Flaubert writes, although Lulu was not a corpse, he was being eaten away by maggots. So now we have a maggot eaten stuffed parrot. One of his wings was broken and the stuffing was coming out of his stomach. But Felicite, the saintly old woman, was now blind. She kissed the parrot on the for the stuffed parrot on the forehead and held her against held him against her cheek. Madame Simon took him from her and went to replace him, the parrot, on this little makeshift altar that uh, Felicite has made. Okay. Flaubert, now at, at the moment of the epiphany, the so-called epiphany that occurs towards the end of, of the story, and I use this word epiphany, it is an epiphany, but let's remember that it was Joyce rather than Flaubert who coined this word uh, for literary studies, but this effectively is an epiphany. The only question is, is, is this a, an epiphany that we are to take seriously, or is this an ironic epiphany? Here's how Flaubert describes Felicite's epiphany. He says, Felicite, you now she's, she's dying, uh, was now entering her final moments. Her breath came in short, raucous gasps, making her sides heave. Along the length of the altar, there was a row of silver candlesticks and china vases containing a vivid display of sunflowers, lilies, peonies, foxgloves, and bunches of hydrangea. A cascade of bright colors fell from the top of the altar down to the carpet, spread out on the cobblestones beneath it. Lulu, the parrot, lay hidden beneath some roses, and all that could be seen of him was the, was the spot of blue on the top of his head, like a disc of lapis lazuli. A blue haze of incense floated up into Felicite's room. She opened her nostrils to breathe it in, savoring it with a mystical fervor. Her eyes closed, and a smile played on her lips. One by one, her heartbeats became slower, growing successively weaker and fainter like a fountain running dry, an echo fading away. With her dry, dying breath, she imagined she saw a huge parrot hovering over her head as the heavens parted to receive her. Okay, well, are we to laugh at that? Or are we to take Flaubert's word for it and say this is a very serious and sad moment, this, this moment of epiphany or the disclosure of the divine at, at, at the dying moment of this, this rather silly uh, old, old woman. Uh, I leave it to the reader to decide. Here you can see, uh, this is St. Peter's Cathedral at the Basilica in Rome in the Vatican. You can see there in the very center uh, of the stained glass of the basilica a figure of, of the dove which is an, again an image of the holy spirit this comes from the right you can see this is the baptism of jesus by the john the baptist where a dove is, is said to descend upon the head of uh, or, or above the head of jesus and, and a voice accompanies the dove saying this is my son with whom i am well pleased and of course in the, in the medieval period there were great debates that took place about the nature 
of the apparition of this dove. You know, what was this dove a mere spectral image? Was it was it an actual dove? Uh, the, these were questions that uh, that uh, perplexed the medieval mind. And uh, in any case, for for our purposes, the dove is 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 a powerful symbol of the Holy Spirit. And by making the dove into a kind of a parrot, uh, the Holy Spirit into a kind of a parrot. Also, remember parrots have language. Uh, you know, Flaubert uh, seems to be playing around with a very powerful and uh, his traditional you know, Christian icon. All right, that's that's the story of, of the first saint in this triptych told in the literary conventions of, of realism uh, and yet uh, concluded with with a, with a moment of uh, epiphany. So we say the theme is the theme of saintliness, that the epiphany is a motif. And I note that at the apparition of the dove, the parrot in the case of Flaubert's story, it's always attended by radiant light. This is what, you know, Aquarius, you know, called claritas, that the moment of epiphany or the exclosure of truth as an event in time or a divine theophany is always attended by a kind of a light. This is where we get the idea of a halo, the halo effect or an aura a glowing light that occurs in these in these moments of divine uh, illumination. So Flaubert's entire story, and, and indeed the two other stories as well, lead up to these moments of epiphany. So we have to attend to the, the, the way in which light plays, uh, it functions at these at the various moments of epiphany in these narratives. And this is where you'll see, if you go look very carefully at the language of Joyce's Dubliners, as well as Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, and uh, and, and Ulysses, you see that the epiphany functions in a very similar way in uh, Joyce's narratives as well. Now, the second story in this triptych, we said, is, is told from a medieval, uh, it, it's, it's a medieval tale to tell of a medieval saint, uh, St. Julian, who's this, the saint of hospitality. And, and I'm going to skip to the very last line of this short story where Flaubert tells us very frankly, this is a story of St. Julian, a hospitator, almost exactly as you will find it told in a stained glass window in a church next to where I was born in Rouen. It's a very famous cathedral, cathedral that say uh, uh, also uh, Monet painted uh, obs rather obsessively, but it's very close to where Flaubert lived and where he wrote and where he was born. And there was a, there was a panel about the life of St. Julian. Now, St. Julian was a saint of hospitality. It's also somewhat of an Oedipal story because he slays both of his parents by uh, accident. And this drives, he, he, was a, he was also an incorrigible hunter who killed a lot of animals. Uh, and the, but, but, towards, but then he, be, he uh, in, in, kind of like Oedipus, who becomes a blind prophet wanderer, St. Julian, you know, becomes a kind of a hermit. Uh, but he's, he's known as, as the saint of hospitality. And so Flaubert tells his story uh, following almost uh, literally the way in which the same story is told in the stained glass in his church. And so generically speaking, you know, we leave, in this case, the conventions of literary realism, and we move into the conventions of medieval uh, hagiography or stories of the li lives of the saint. And so it's not just, you know, it's not just the, the, the theme. I mean, the theme of the story remains the same, the theme of saintliness, but but generically speaking, the way in which the story is told is, is quite different. Now here, this is, these are images from, this is the, on the far left, you see the cathedral in Rouen, I said Monet is going to paint, but uh, you can see there uh, the, on the far right, the, uh, the, the stained glass in its entirety, but there is, is a detail from it, which tells the life of the saint, which so Flaubert literally, you know, he, he went to church, he, he, he studied this, these panels and the stained glass, and he wrote the story of this saint from these different panels that he saw in, in the glass. Here's, here are a couple of other images of St. Julian uh, Hospitalier. He, you know, he, he was, a, again, a saint of, of hospitality, much like you know, Abraham is the prophet of hospitality. Zeus is the god of hospitality. So he, he was the, the uh, saint who welcomed the other. Okay, hagiography. This is a again a generic word for these are tales of saintly figures, a very prominent uh, genre in the medieval period and even in the late medieval period, early 
a renaissance that persists. It persists into this day in the, in the Catholic tradition. These are stories of saintly lives that are told often for allegorical purposes to, to inspire, uh, for, for moral purposes, to, to uh, exhort those who read them to lead a better life, to lead more moral and saintly lives. So you can see the word comes from the Greek, hagios, which means holy, graphy, which means writing. So hagiography is a biography of a saint, ecclesiastical leader, or it could be a nun, it could be an icon of any of the world's religions, someone who, who, who leads a saintly life. It, it goes beyond the Catholic tradition, but its origins you know, come from this generic convention in, in the medieval period. But here are some examples you can see in the in the more contemporary period, 1756, Butler's Lives of the Saints remains one of the most influential texts in the Catholic tradition is, is read uh, even today. And so Flaubert is following these more medieval conventions in, this, in the case of this mid, middle panel of the trick tip triptych, then uh, in the, then the conventions of 19th century literary realism in the first panel of the life of Felicite. So we're going to see again, but it's about saintliness, and it's also uh, this this motif of the uh, epiphany attended by a radiant glow of light is also going to occur in this tale as well. Uh, here you can see uh, if you if you look at the halos over the heads of these different saints, there in the middle is Thomas Aquinas, who uh, was was the uh, father of uh, what's called realism. Now, the theology, Andre Breton links uh, literary realism explicitly to the to what's called Thomism or theological realism of, of Aquinas, who was the theologian of, of the Epiphany, very much influenced by Aristotle, as opposed to, say, uh, Augustine, who was influenced by Plato. But, I, but I, I'd like you to attend to these images of, of the halo the light, the glow. This is this idea, the idea of the epiphany or the light shining forth, the glow uh, from, from, from within. This is uh, very much uh, linked to the idea of truth as clarity or the disclosure of truth as presence, which is a, a metaphysical way of thinking about truth, but is also a li a linked to the idea of the epiphany as well. So here's a description now. This comes towards the conclusion of the story of St. Julian. So he's a hermit now. He's living in his little hermit shed, and he sees this very hideous figure who comes to him. Now, like uh, Abraham, who welcomed the guests to his tent, and it turned out that they were angels. Uh, at first, you know, Julian sees this, this, and Abraham showed hospitality to these angels without knowing that they were angels. But so too, St. Julian, he sees this leper, and he's, he, Julian offers his hospitality despite the repulsiveness of this leper that he encounters. Here's Flaubert. He says, one night as he, St. Julian, lay asleep, he thought he heard someone calling him. There's sort of the call of the other. Very important uh, th theme of, the of theological discourse as well. He strained his ears, but all he could hear was the rushing of the water. After a moment's hesitation, Julian cast off from the shore this little boat. Immediately the water became calm. The boat slipped easily through it and reached the other bank where a man stood waiting for him. This man was wrapped in a tattered linen cloth. His face resembled a plaster mask and his eyes were redder than blazing coals. Julian held the lantern up to look at this sort of hideous figure and saw that his body was covered with the most hideous sores of leprosy. When they reach the hut, Julian, and so he loads up the leper in his boat, brings him back to his hut. He says, when, when they reached the hut, Julian closed the door and saw the leper seated on the stool. The shroud-like cloth, which he had been wrapped in, had fallen to his waist to reveal his shoulders, chest, and scrawny arms, completely covered in scabs and sores. It's a very hideous figure. Uh, deep furrows scored his brow. Like a skeleton, he had a hole where his nose should have been. His lips were blue, and from his mouth came waves of foul-smelling breath, as thick as fog. I am hungry, this hideous leper says, and Julian gave him what he had. Again, Julian's the saint of hospitality. Then he said, I am thirsty, and Julian went to get his jug. Then he said, I am cold. 
Julian took his candle and lit a bundle of bracken in the middle of the hut. My bones are like ice, he said. Come and lie beside me. Take off your clothes so that I may feel the warmth of your body. So, you know, this is, this is, uh, you know, this is not a scene of, uh, of homosexuality. He, this, he, he's, this is a very, he's, he's climbing into bed with a very hideous, uh, sore, festered uh, leper. Uh, Julian took off his clothes, the naked as on the day he was born, he got back into the bed. Against his thigh, he could feel the leper's skin as cold as a snake and as rough as a file. But he's, he's doing it. He's, he's giving the warmth of his body to this hideous leper. Julian whispered words of comfort, but the leper could only stammer and reply, I'm going to die. Come closer. Give me your warmth. No, not just with your hands. Give me your whole body. Julian lay down at full length on top of the leper, mouth to mouth, breast to breast. The leper clasped him in his arms, and all at once his eyes shone with starry splendor. His hair spread out like rays of sunshine, and the breath from his nostrils smelt as sweet as roses. A cloud of incense rose from the hearth, and the waves outside began to sing. In the same instant, Julian felt, as it were, a flood of boundless delights and unearthly bliss. So something is happening. A, a transformation is taking place. This disgusting, pussy, sore-filled, smelly leper is now uh, emanating light from his eyes and rays of sunshine from his hair. And his breath is being transformed to the smell of sweet as uh, roses and many times for instance in the catholic tradition apparitions of saints figures like mary and so on are attended by uh the the smell of roses as well so he's having a uh, a moment of, of transcendental uh, ecstasy and bliss uh, they entered his enraptured soul and he in whose arms he lay grew taller and taller until his head and his feet touched the two walls of the hut the roof flew off and the firmament opened above them Julian rose up into the blue, into the open arms of our Lord Jesus Christ, who bore him up to heaven. So, all right, is this a sham epiphany, as Jameson says? Possibly, uh, but certainly uh, our artist here is, in, in structurally speaking, again, generically speaking, this is a, a work of hagiography, a life of a saint. It's the second panel in a triptych. We fought thematically. We have a, yet another story of the life of the saint. And in terms of motif, we have the epiphany that occurs, yet another epiphany that occurs, attended by this idea of, 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 of an emanating radiant uh, light that shines forth. Now, whether or not it's this is just literary formalism or Flaubert's playing around is, is uh, it's an interesting question. I'm not sure we need to decide. Uh, but uh, it is it is an interesting question. Uh, so this this is in effect an epiphany of hospitality, and again in the in the biblical narrative, Abraham welcomes the three visitors into his tent, and uh, he's given Sarah, who is who, who is unable to have children, is is given uh, is, she's very old at this point, and the angels tell her that she will have a child. This child is Isaac. And then what, what you know, they go on to the next town, which is the town of Abraham's nephew, Lot, who's also a prophet, at least in the Islamic tradition. And Lot um, is, uh, you know, these, these angels are received very poorly by the men of Sodom who want to do violence to them. And so as a consequence, God destroys Sodom by raining fire down from the sky uh, upon it. Abraham, because he gave his blessing to the angels, not knowing that they were angels, he himself receives uh, a blessing. So again, uh, uh, Julian is, uh, like Abraham, a saint of hospitality. Now the final panel in the triptych is the story of Salome, which was greatly inspirational to figures like uh, Oscar Wilde, but also to Orientalist painters as well. Now, this is a story told in the Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is the story where Herod tells, uh, this is a biblical tale where uh, Herod, you know, uh, tells his, uh, his stepdaughter that he'll give her anything up to half of his kingdom if she'll simply dance for him. 
and uh, the mother of, uh, of uh, Salome wants the head of John the Baptist on a platter, which Herod is, is reluctant to, uh, to, to give to her. But when Salome dances for uh, Herod, uh, you know, he, he has to, he's compelled to stay with his uh, part of the bargain. And he indeed gives her the head of John the Baptist on the platter. Now this, this theme, it was not only interesting to Flaubert, it was very interesting to many painters who were inspired by the Orientalist tradition as well, because it has these sort of themes of sexuality and, and gruesome violence uh, in it as well. And so, you know, Flaubert was very, um, he was very, you know, he, he took a trip to Egypt, did many disreputable things while he was there, but he was very influenced by the Orientalism in painting and his, some of his novels were Orientalist as well. And this particular tale in, in the triptych, although it's about a saint, the Saint John the Baptist, like the other two panels, generically, again, we have yet another transformation in the sense that this is, is an instance of, uh, of what say, someone like Edward Said would call Orientalism. It was part of or the Orientalist movement in painting. Now, Orientalism doesn't mean you know, the Far East in this context, not, not in the case of France, not like you know uh, Vietnam or China or Japan. It, it referred to uh, the Arab world, which France was colonizing at this time, and, and depictions that uh, painters gave of the Arab world, which often were luridly sexual and, and very violent and also stereotypical and, and racist. Um, so Edward Said in his book, Orientalism, discusses this in, in great detail. And you can see some Jerome paint, the Jerome paintings, were one, Jerome was perhaps the most famous of the Orientalists. Um, but you can see there on, on the far right, this is a painting that you'll see today at the um, Musée d'Orsay in Paris. It's a very enormous tablet. When it was first displayed, people were aghast, you know, this uh, image of beheading. Many of these, many besides being very sexual, many of the Orientalist paintings are quite violent, and they also deal with themes of, of Islamic piety uh, as well. But they're, they're stereotypical themes. And I might note in passing that in the uh, Islamic world, in which the Second Commandment is from the uh, Ten, Commandment, the, uh, Ten Commandments of the Mosaic Law is preserved, unlike the Christian world where the, where the Second Commandment is, is dropped. And then the the, the, the the tenth commandment, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house, thy neighbor's wife is bifurcated. So you still you'll get ten commandments, but you lose the second commandment, which is the ban on graven images. It's it, this commandment is preserved in the Islamic and the Judaic world. So uh, my point here is that this kind of representational discourse, which is stylistically uh, uh, stereotypical, is nonetheless you know it's representational in the sense that the that the, that the images that we see represent the real, although they're not, you know, they're not realist. They're they're more idealized, stereotypical images, and yet um, uh, this would be this kind of art would be impossible in the Islamic context, uh, in in so far as the particularly in the Arab world, in which one adheres very carefully to the ban on graven images, and so the, the art tends to be far more abstract and geometrical. So this is most certainly, even though the themes are uh, themes dealing with the Arab world, this is a this is a European, uh, French especially convention through and through. And Flaubert is operating within this within the generic conventions of this uh, tradition as well. Here are some more images you can see from the Orientalist uh, tradition, which which really came on the heels of realism in France, literary uh, or, or, or realism and painting in France. It's like, uh, it's like some of those images I showed you previously and was then followed by Impressionism. So Orientalism is really what comes between realism and the advent of uh, Impressionism. And it, and it coincides with the, co the French colonization of the Arab world. And there you see, you know, up on the, on the far left, Napoleon riding, his, riding on a camel. And there on the, on, on the uh, right at the bottom, there's uh, Napoleon as well in, in Cairo. So these were themes that were very prominent at the time that the French colonized Egypt, especially. So here's how Flaubert is going to describe the dance of Salome in these very sort of lurid, uh, eroticized Orientalist terms. He says, she danced like the priestesses of the Indies, like the Nubian girls of the cataracts, like the, the Bacchants of Lydia, 
Her body twisted in every direction like a flower buffeted by the storm. The jewels that hung from her ears danced about her face. Her silken shift shimmered in the light, and from her arms, her feet, and her clothing leapt unseen sparks that inflamed the hearts of the men who watched her. A harp played sweet music, and the crowd responded with shouts of acclamation. Without bending her knees, she spread her legs apart and inclined her body so low that her chin touched the floor. Nomads weaned on abstinence. Roman soldiers practiced in debauchery. Mean-minded publicans and priests, embittered by religious wrangling, all looked on, their nostrils dilated, quivering with desire. Next, she danced in a circle around the Tetrix table, spinning wildly on her feet like the humming top of a sorceress. The Tetrix voice rose above the din, Come to my arms, you shall have Capernaum, the plains of Tiberias, half, all of my citadels, half of my kingdom. So Flaubert is retelling this this biblical story, but it, but you know you can see here how the, the 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 discourse of Flaubert very much mirrors the uh, the kind of painting that was very popular at this time, which is this is so this is an Orientalist uh, you know genre that he's uh, operating, and he was he was he was obsessed with the Orient in in his own uh, debauched way. Flaubert here you can see again painting of Salome, you know, dancing or similar to Salome dancing, very prominent theme. Her neck and her spine formed a perfect right angle. The colored silks which she wore around her legs fell down over her shoulders like rainbows and encircled her face just a few inches from the ground. Her lips were painted red, her eyebrows black. She had startling dark eyes. Tiny beads of sweat clung to her brows like droplets of water on white marble. I want you to give me on a plate the head of, she had forgotten the name. Then with a smile, she continued, the head of Jokanan. The Tetrarch stank back on his couch, stunned. Now Herod, Herod in the biblical account doesn't want you know, to do anything to John the Baptist because he, he essentially because he fears him, even though John the Baptist denounces him quite uh, uh, unambiguously for what he, the, John the Baptist views as his, uh, incestuous, you know, uh, marriage with his brother's wife. Uh, and so, um, you know, but uh, so Herod keeps John the Baptist in prison. But this in the biblical account, you know, after the dance of Salome, he does have John the Baptist uh, beheaded. And so the head of John the Baptist becomes legendary in all of the tra Abrahamic traditions. In, in the Islamic tradition, John the Baptist is known as the prophet Yahya. It's said that his head is buried at the um, uh, in, in uh, Damascus at the uh, mosque there will be the site of the place of the second coming of the prophet Isa or Jesus in the Christian tradition. Uh, so there are great uh, stories told about this head. Uh, suddenly they heard the clatter of footsteps in the quarters outside. The tension became unbearable. Then in came the head. This is after John the Baptist has, has head cut off. Manet holding it aloft by the hair and proudly acknowledging the applause which greeted him. He put it on a plate and gave it to Salome, who carried it nimbly up the steps to the balcony. And there you can see this theme in, uh, in European painting, this theme which, is, which encodes these erotic as well as violent images of, of beheading, which are part and parcel of the Orientalist tradition. They all had a close look at it. The sharp blade of the sword as it was brought down onto the head had sliced into the jaw. The corners of the mouth were drawn back in a grimace. The beard was splattered with clots of already congealed blood. The closed eyelids were as pale as shells. The head was bathed in the light of the candelabra that shone around it. So there we have the aura, the epiphany of light, the uh, halo, the, the illuminating claritas uh, linked to this idea of the epiphany or truth's disclosure, the halo effect. You can see here images of John the Baptist's head all accompanied by halos. On the far uh, left at the bottom, that's said to be the actual head of, of John the Baptist. I'm, I'm not sure that it is. Uh, there's also, if you go to France uh, in Aix-en-Provence, you can see the head of what's said to be Mary Magdalene 
which is preserved in a cathedral uh, there. So, all right, well, Flaubert, you know, he, he went to Egypt. You can read more about his exploits in Egypt in a book called Flaubert in Egypt. This was uh, a, a travel log that he wrote prior to his, when he was a young man, prior to his composition of Madame Bovary, filled with tales of his adventures in brothels and, uh, and very offensive. It's, it's, it's frankly quite a, an offensive text. So if you're easily offended, uh, I wouldn't suggest reading it, but it does give you a sense of, of how the Orient worked upon uh, Flaubert's uh, imagination and where he drew his inspiration from for a lot of these different stories. And I, I would remind you that Flaubert, you know, was uh, he, he was a great artist and a great writer, but he was a writer who, who, who lived in the, at the apex of French uh, imperialism. And these themes are not to be uh, neglected in his work.